Hello everyone and welcome back to DC Central and in this video we're going to be going over and discussing my thoughts so far on the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover, so let's discuss. Before we begin though, I would like to of course address the reason why I have not been uploading any videos as of late uh, and the reason why I've not been reviewing Crisis individually uh, is simply because for one, um, as I've discussed a lot recently in videos is that I've been very busy recently. I have been uh, doing a lot of things in life, uh, meeting with a lot of different people and going out and doing a lot of different things and that has allowed me to kind of uh, do a lot more things in my day to day life instead of just making videos and it has allowed, it's made making videos uh, a lot more difficult. So I have not been able to make as many videos, which is why I was not able to review Crisis uh, individually in the week that it came out. Of course, if you follow me on Twitter, you would have seen my kind of reactions to it and how I've been feeling about it. Of course, I was tweeting about it and things like that. But in regards to making videos, I just wasn't really able to make videos in that time frame. And of course, since then, it's just kind of been the run up to Christmas and it's been super, super busy with that. So anyway, with all that out of the way... We now have Crisis on Infinite Earths. We are now midway through the crossover. Uh, it's been obviously a long anticipated wait for this one. This is the crossover that kind of the entire Arrowverse has been building towards. It's the Arrowverse's version of Endgame, if you will. It's kind of this huge event that we've all been waiting for. And of course, we are now in the mid-season break um, with the crossover continuing with Arrow and Legends in January when the shows return. But how has it been so far? For me personally, I have found the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover to be rather underwhelming so far. Uh, there are uh, there are a lot of things about it that I really like, which I will discuss, but there's also quite a lot of things, um, a lot more bigger issues with the crossover that I have that kind of really bring it down quite a few pegs for me. Uh, but I, I'm going to go in and dive into it all and discuss it all in this video. So make sure you strap in and prepare yourselves for this one. And also make sure you let me know what you have thought about the crossover so far down below. Because it seems like most people are really enjoying it and having a really good time with it, which is great. Um, I really wish I was in that camp. Um, I just have some issues with the crossover overall that um, are kind of making it a bit more troubling to watch for me and a bit more difficult to kind of come to grips with um although there are a lot of things that i do like as well so let's jump into the positives so firstly with the positives the character cameos that they have been bringing in for this crossover have been absolutely amazing like the first scene of this crossover is fantastic where they kind of jump across all these different earths like we see the earth from the batman 1989 universe we also see the titans universe obviously we get to see like uh uh hawk and jason todd from titans we get to see them on there so we get to see some really cool cameos we also get like obviously the birds of prey cameo and things like that really awesome stuff and all the other cameos in this are absolutely fantastic like bringing back john wesley ship as the 90s flash of course he showed up in last year's crossover but to bring him back was really cool and give him a much more bigger and more substantial role is really good for him especially because they actually kind of explained where he went at the end of elseworlds a lot of people including myself were very disappointed that he was just kind of zapped out of existence uh, in that crossover but it turns out he wasn't he was actually uh, taken somewhere else and we actually get to see that in this which is really nice um also we got uh, kevin conroy as bruce wayne of course kevin conroy being the person who has voiced batman in many different iterations of the character such as batman the animated series and also the arc video games we got to see him play a older version of bruce wayne which was a very interesting take on the character this version was a lot older he was a lot more violent he was a lot more bitter um and was actually a killer and he actually ended up killing that earth's version of superman which was very interesting um i've seen a lot of people kind of uh, be very hesitant towards this version of Batman. Others really like it. I thought it was a really interesting take, like, to kind of give this character this really dark edge, and especially because this version of Batman, you know, kind of breaking the one rule that Batman has, I think it's interesting. So, I like that, and I think Kevin Conroy sold it really well, especially when you first hear his voice. It kind of sent shivers down my spine, just hearing his voice come out of the character, because obviously this is such an iconic voice for Batman. I was really excited to hear that. Another great one was, um, of course, Tom Welling coming back as the Smallville Clark Kent. This was really interesting as well, because I think a lot of people were expecting him to kind of suit up in this crossover. I wasn't personally, uh, and he doesn't. He's literally in one scene, and we get to see him kind of uh, show up, and he's just there on the Smallville farm with Erica Durant, who of course played Lois Lane in Smallville. She reprises her role here. Uh, we get to see how uh, he has been living his life. He actually has a couple of kids with Lois now, and he has actually given up his powers. That was actually really interesting, but also a really good way of explaining why uh, Tom Welling would not be suiting up for the crossover. I think it was a really good and smart way just to kind of make him kind of, you know, to kind of write him out of the crossover in that way was a really smart move. Um, and it comes to a really interesting conclusion where we kind of see that Lex Luthor actually shows up and tries to kind of defeat him with Kryptonite, but it doesn't actually do anything to him because he hasn't got any powers anymore. So that was really cool. Uh, I liked his cameo a lot. 
a huge one who came in in episode three uh, was Black Lightning. Of course, Cress Williams, who plays Black Lightning over on his own show, he came over into the Arrowverse for the very first time, and that was really great. He fit into the universe so well. We all knew he was going to. Like, we all know Black Lightning as a character was just one that was going to kind of fit into the Arrowverse's infrastructure very, very well, and Black Lightning does that absolutely. I think he fitted in perfectly and i really like his relationship and his friendship that they've already started to build with barry i can see in the future that him and barry you know sort of the black lightning and the flash will cross over a little bit i can kind of see that happening kind of like how they've been setting up batwoman and supergirl to do quite a lot of crossovers i could see them doing flash and black lightning now the arrow is coming to an end i could definitely see them doing that especially because they've really established the relationship between barry and jefferson i can definitely see them kind of having some future cross pollination which is gonna be really fun uh, it depends what they do with black lightning come the end of crisis like will they merge his earth with earth one or will they keep it separate because obviously we know the showrunner black lightning has been very kind of anti-crossover so we'll have to kind of see how they handle black lightning coming out of the crossover uh and then also the the character who kind of stole the crossover for me so far was uh tom ellis as lucifer of course if you watch lucifer you know him uh he shows up for a brief little cameo in episode three and it was absolutely fantastic tom ellis just nails this character he's so good as him i haven't watched all of lucifer i've only watched the first season but i absolutely loved the first season i can't wait to watch more and um i absolutely love the character of lucifer he's so much fun and to see him kind of come in interact with constantine we actually find out he has a bit of history with constantine which is fun it does kind of mess with the continuity of lucifer a little bit but it's fine it's just like a one little throwaway cameo but I really loved his introduction. It was just so much fun to have him there and just kind of add more depth to the Arrowverse by having, like, the devil there. It's, it's just a lot of fun. Again, it does kind of screw up continuity in both um, universes, but, again, this is clearly just a fun cameo they were able to get because Lucifer is technically a DC property they could get away with it. So I really enjoyed that. His interactions with Mia were really fun. His interactions with Diggle were great. He kind of compared Diggle to Amenadiel, which was fun. Uh, if you know Amenadiel on Lucifer, you can kind of see the connection there. So I really enjoyed that. But the best cameo for me, and he's not even really a cameo, he's actually got more of like an extended role, but it's definitely Brandon Routh as Kingdom Come Superman. I absolutely love this version of Superman. He is phenomenal. Like, he just embodies Superman. I mean, I always liked Brandon as Superman in Superman Returns, but this version of Superman is so much better because... He is a much older, much more weary Superman, but he also just continues that hope and actually has a lot more realism surrounding him. Because the problem that a lot of people have with the character of Superman is that he's very uh, basic. He's very happy. You know, he's very just... He's very naive almost in a sense. What, whereas what I liked about this version of Superman is compared to like Tyler's version, which granted, I like Tyler's version a lot. He's actually my favorite Superman. The version that Brandon plays actually has been through stuff and you can actually see that obviously he survived that kind of gas attack from the Joker that killed Lois. I think that this version of Superman, he knows that there's a lot more grey in the world and it's not just black and white. And I think that his kind of portrayal of that and Brandon's portrayal of that really shines through the character. And I like the fact that this version of Superman is a lot more world weary, which makes him a lot more relatable and a lot more easier to get on board with in comparison to other versions of Superman that we've seen. So I really love this version of Superman. His suit looks fantastic. Yes, it is a little goofy, but I think that, you know, it's kind of meant to be like that. And I think when you actually see it on screen, it actually looks great. And I love the scenes between him and Tyler. I love their fight scene. I thought that was really fun that was really well executed and i think that this version of superman has just kind of been the highlight of the crossover for me i've loved him and i can't wait to see if they do with him anything in the future i have a feeling they are going to kill this one off in this crossover i can't really see them doing anything with him post this especially because we know brandon is leaving legends this season but i would love to see this version uh, continue but if he doesn't i'm still happy with what we got in this crossover and uh, speaking of Brandon, I think that the MVPs of this crossover have easily been Sarah and Ray from the Legends. Um, this is mainly because we have not seen these characters like this in such a long time. Legends has continued to kind of ruin Sarah and Ray as characters, especially in Season 4. Um, I think that these two characters were really destroyed by Season 4, just making them joke characters. They're kind of caricatures now. They're not the same characters that they were. You know, Sarah and Ray are kind of og arrowverse characters i mean they were both on arrow originally obviously sarah was introduced in season two ray was introduced in season three and i think that these two characters have just completely fallen by the wayside because legends has turned them into these weird caricatures of themselves what i love about this is that sarah and ray have both been their old selves in this crossover and i've loved every second of it this is evident by the fact that they have got different writers like the writers 
of the other shows just know how to handle these characters much better than the Legends writers do, uh, because they actually made them feel like the characters that they used to be rather than the characters they are now, and I really like that. And I think this was like proven last season on Arrow, or um, yeah, last season on Arrow when we got to see Sarah come back for one episode and she was much better there than she ever was on Legends. And I think that this just proves that these characters just need to go back to their original shows or legends needs to go back to the direction they started off doing rather than this really over the top comedy direction that they've gone the last couple of years i think that these two characters have just proven that that point and the fact that they've been so strong and so consistently strong in this crossover are amazing like sarah has easily had the best moments for me her interactions with oliver have been top-notch stuff and i've absolutely loved it and ray again just kind of going back to his old self it felt so good so they have definitely been the mvps for me for sure also, I must say, I've actually really liked Batwoman in this crossover. I mean, I haven't continued to watch Batwoman. I've only watched the first episode. I didn't watch any more than that, just because it didn't really wow me. Uh, but I have to say that I think uh, Ruby Rose has definitely improved over time, because her performance in this crossover so far has actually been pretty strong. I ha I've quite enjoyed her, and I actually really enjoyed Kate as a character throughout this ensemble. So I think, you know, hats off to Ruby Rose. She's clearly been improving as the series has gone on. Also, I love the idea of the Paragons that they've introduced. They started to tease that at the beginning of uh, this season of Arrow, and they've kind of teased it on the Flash a little bit. But the idea of the Paragons are really cool. Obviously, there are seven Paragons, and I think that the fact they all have different names, and it's each a different character. Obviously, we know the characters are Kingdom Come Superman, uh, Ryan Choi, which I'm very excited to see what they do with Ryan Choi. That's a really cool character they brought in. Uh, Sarah, Barry, um, Kate, um, who am I forgetting? Lex? No, who am I forgetting? Who am I forgetting? It's it's Sarah, Barry, Kate, Kara, Clark, Ryan, and Jean. That's it. Uh, so it's them. It's them seven. And I think that that's a really cool idea to kind of have a seven of the characters that we've known throughout the Arrowverse to kind of be these paragons of different things. Like Barry is the paragon of love, and Jean is the paragon of or of honor. Sarah is the paragon of destiny. Like to give them all their own titles, I think is really interesting. The only query I have for this is that why isn't Oliver a paragon? That's the only thing I have a question about because obviously, if you look at the characters that we have, like. All the lead characters of the shows each are a paragon. Like Sarah is basically the lead of Legends, so she's got one. Barry's one. Kate's one. Kara's one. But Oliver isn't. I don't understand. But anyway, I like the idea of the paragons, and I think it's a really cool kind of test of what they're doing. And given how episode three ended with the paragons being the only people left and being stuck in the kind of, you know, middle dimension, I cannot wait to see what they do with these characters, especially with Lex thrown in the mix. Going over to the negative side, though, for me, the overall arcing story of Crisis has been really weak. I think that, you know, Crisis for me has honestly felt like a bunch of really cool scenes and a bunch of really cool ideas really awkwardly meshed together with a really poorly executed story. Um, I think that the story overall has just been incredibly just whatever. Like, they've just kind of put it together and said right this is happening then this is happening and then this and then this and then this blah 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 um and then here's a cool scene here's a character here's a cameo here's another cool action scene whatever and then oh how are we gonna get to the next place oh i don't know let's just write it really clumsily and then we'll jump into the next thing and distract them with another cool thing and i just i haven't really enjoyed the overall structure of the crossover it's felt very messy to me it's felt very weak and very awkward it's like the characters and the writers don't really know how to kind of progress this story which is interesting because obviously they've been doing this for years now i mean obviously i don't know maybe is it batwoman that's throwing off throwing them off with the new writers coming in i don't know but you know they've they've structured these crossovers before they know how to do it and i've never had this issue with the crossovers before like crisis on infinite uh, crisis on earth x did it really well i think uh, elseworlds did it fine so the fact that crisis on infinite earth which is by far their biggest crossover of course this is the biggest thing that the arrowverse has ever faced the fact that they are kind of really messing this up in terms of how they are progressing the story it really shocks me actually and again it might just be because maybe batwoman came in and they're new writers and perhaps that's what's throwing it off like maybe it was that middle portion that kind of really dispersed throughout the rest of it but i think that you know the idea of them really messing the story up of this because again the story is kind of non-existent and i also think that they have really done a poor job of um explaining things because obviously the entire season of arrow has basically been set up for this and so has the flash to be fair and I still am kind of unfamiliar with things. Like, obviously, I've not read the Crisis on Infinite Earths comic, so I'm not going into it with pre-comic knowledge. Um, I know some things here and there, of course, but, like, for the most part, I don't know the basic story, the outline. So I can't follow it in the way that comic readers are. So with that, I'm expecting a bit more explanation from the writers as a TV-only viewer. 
and I haven't really been receiving that because it's very, um, again, I don't really know what the overall story is and kind of how it's playing out because it doesn't explain itself very well, especially with certain elements like Harbinger showing up. Obviously, they've kind of set up Harbinger on this season of Arrow with Lila and things like that, which is fine. I've been following that very, very easily and that's been sort of no issue whatsoever. But they've kind of made a Harbinger and then she just kind of met up with the Anti-Monitor and then now she's evil, which I knew that happened. But again, what was her relationship with the Anti-Monitor? Where did that come from? And the biggest question mark to me comes from the form of Pariah. Now, Pariah is a big character in the Crisis comic. I knew that. Obviously, this version of Pariah is actually the version of Nash Wells that we've seen on The Flash this season. But where did this guy come from? Like, we literally saw Nash Wells. He showed up on Earth 1. He's been digging into this hole underground Central City for ages. He finally got in there. And now in this crossover, he shows up as Pariah. He's in this costume. He has this kind of curse upon him that he has to watch worlds die. And he kind of has these powers where he can teleport people. But they've never explained any of this. They've not explained where he went, how he became Pariah, the powers that he has. They haven't explained any of this. So for me, the biggest question mark comes in the form of Pariah because I don't know a single thing about him. He just kind of showed up in the end of episode uh, one. And, or maybe it was episode two, I can't remember. And that was it. And then he just kind of has a role in episode three. He talks about how he has this curse. And then he transported all the Paragons away when the Earth started to get wiped out. And then he died. So I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with Pariah. Uh, whether they continue a story, who knows. Uh, and again, like the Anti-Monitor. Like, given the fact that they have spent so long setting up Crisis. And the fact we know nothing about the Anti-Monitor. He literally showed up in one scene uh, so far in the crossover. And even then, not properly. Uh, he, I know nothing about the Anti-Monitor either. So, you know, we're three episodes into this crossover. We've got two more episodes to go. And I still know nothing about the villain. I think that's kind of crazy. So for me, the writing overall for this crossover has been really sloppy. It seems like they've been a lot more focused on the fan service, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But if you're going to have all this fan service and not have anything interesting to connect it with, I don't know what the point is. And the other major negative I have for this crossover so far, which is a thing that's very personal to me, I cannot, I cannot believe and I cannot get behind how they've handled Oliver. Um, Oliver, of course, is my favorite TV character of all time. I love Oliver Queen. I love Stephen Amell. Um, and for me, how they've handled Oliver this season and, and handled him in this crossover in particular, I think it's disgraceful. Um, maybe it's just me. I don't know, but I hate the direction they've gone with it. The idea of Oliver becoming the Spectre is something I think is beyond absurd. And it's something that... As a fan of Arrow, like as a huge fan of Arrow, a mega fan of Arrow, like you guys know this, my favorite show of all time is Arrow. And my favorite TV character of all time, not just in the Arrowverse, but of all TV is Oliver Queen. I cannot physically get behind this choice. Because if you would have told me when I first started watching Arrow season one a few years ago, that, you know, Oliver's character arc is going to end with him in a crossover as a otherworldly being known as the Spectre, I would have said you were bonkers and not in a good way. I would have been like, if you could time travel to the future, please tell them not to do that because it is awful. Um, because Arrow and Oliver, the whole point of Arrow as a show, even within the context of the Arrowverse, is that it was the grounded, realistic show of the bunch. It was the vigilante show. It wasn't the superhero show, it was the vigilante show. So to take a vigilante character and turn him into a being like the Spectre, it's just stupid to me. I just don't understand. I I mean, I get why they're choosing Oliver for this role, because obviously Oliver is the OG character, he's the original one, they kind of want to find a way of keeping him around without killing him off, like, officially. And we all knew that he wasn't going to die, like, officially, uh, because I think a lot of us assumed he was going to go into, like, the Heaven Dimension, but it seems like this is what they're doing instead. I just, I hate this idea of him kind of floating around the Arrowverse post his death, kind of just being the Spectre. I think it's a ridiculous idea. I hate it. Because, again, this is not the right choice for this character. And maybe it's just me as someone who has a lot of personal attachment to the character and a personal attachment to the show, but I love the fact that Arrow has always tried to keep itself very grounded. Of course, they have had its certain elements, like Season 4 and things like that, where it went a bit too over the top. But for the most part, it stuck itself pretty grounded and has tried to remain the grounded show of the bunch. 
So to take that lead character from that show and turn him into this complete godlike being, I just think it's absolutely offensive and borderline going against the show and its morals and what it stands for. And I hate it. I think it's absolutely appalling. And, you know, Oliver as a character should not be handled in this way. If Oliver is going to die in this crossover, then just kill him. And that leads me to my next issue, which is that obviously Oliver dies in the first episode of this crossover. He gets killed off right at the beginning. And for me, that should be the most emotional thing I have ever seen on TV history. Again, as someone who loves Arrow and my favorite character is Oliver, that should be the, like, his death should be the most emotional thing I have ever witnessed on TV, for me personally. That should be the most emotional scene ever. But when he died, I literally felt nothing. And it was because, for two reasons. One, I knew he wasn't actually dead, which he was not. He came back in the very next episode. And for two, the characters he was surrounded by made no impact. Because all the characters he was surrounded with were not connected to Oliver and did not care, minus a couple of exceptions. Like, Mia was there, but again, I don't really care about Mia, and I don't really think their relationship has been established particularly well, so that didn't really do anything for me. The only one that did something was Sarah. Again, Sarah is the MVP of this crossover. Her scenes with Oliver have been fantastic, so Sarah did get to me. And Barry did a little bit as well, because obviously him and Barry do have a lot of history. But everyone else, Kara, no. Kate, no. Ray, to a certain extent, no. Like, every other character he was surrounded by characters that should not have been surrounding him in his death it should not have been those characters again sarah i can accept mia even though i don't particularly agree with it i could accept everyone else though no the other characters who should be with him are characters like diggle felicity obviously felicity is not in this season but by the final episode she will be uh so diggle felicity renee curtis diner these people should be the ones surrounding Oliver, not these other random heroes from the Arrowverse. It made it feel very fake, and again, I had no emotional connection because no, none of the other characters were really having any emotion. Again, Sarah was, and Mia was, Barry a little bit, but nobody else actually felt like they were sad at the fact that Oliver had died. So that leads that the audience doesn't really feel sad about him dying either, because no one else was really asked, so the audience wasn't asked. And again, I wasn't asked because I was thinking, well, he's going to come back, obviously. They're not going to kill him in episode one. And they didn't. They brought him back in the next episode, which I just knew was going to happen. So again, I literally felt no emotional impact to that, and it completely spoiled the idea of Oliver being killed off in this crossover. Um, so for me, overall, the how they've handled Oliver, I think, has been absolutely ridiculous. I've hated it. And if they keep going in this direction, like, if they are going to make him the Spectre and they are going to go with that going forward where they can sort of bring Steven back for cameos to do stuff like that, I'm just not going to be a fan of that. I'm not going to be a fan of that idea, that sort of directional choice, that creative choice. I think it's a really poor idea for the show and for the character. And it makes this whole thing, his whole journey, feel kind of superfluous to me. And I kind of despise it. But anyway, rant over, I can kind of calm down a little bit now, and I can bring this to a conclusion. Overall, to me, Crisis on Infinite Earths, again, it's been slightly underwhelming. I think there's a lot of really good stuff in it, and there's a lot of really cool stuff in it for fans. And, you know, as a fan myself, I've loved all the cameos, I've loved the action sequences, I've loved Sarah and Ray actually being their own characters rather than caricatures. And again, some of the lore elements they brought in, like with uh, Pariah... Uh, even though it's not been the best handled, I've still enjoyed the idea of Pariah. I just need a bit more, you know, meat on the bones with that. And also with uh, Harbinger. And again, the idea of the Paragons, I think, is really fun and interesting. I've also just felt like the story that's connecting all of these things is incredibly weak to the point where it feels like it's almost nothing. Um, and again, Oliver being the main character of this entire universe and being the linchpin of all of it, being handled in such a poor and almost uneducated way just has kind of spoiled it for me so for me crisis on infinite earths again there's a lot of good stuff but there's also a lot of bad stuff and for me it's a very underwhelming crossover on the whole obviously i'm not going to rank it among the other crossovers just yet because we haven't seen the full thing we still got two more episodes to go we've got the arrow and the legends episode um but as of right now i could say that i can i have enjoyed all the other crossovers more than this so far um and that's a real shame, because this is meant to be the biggest event of this entire universe. I don't think they'll ever top this in regards to, like, size and scale. So that's a real shame to me, and I think that this crossover, you know, it could really improve in the last couple of episodes. Like, this crossover did get better for me. Like, episode one, 2 was better than 1, and 3 was better than 2. Um, so hopefully, it will continue in the upwards trajectory. But as of right now, I've just not loved it overall, unfortunately. 
and I just think that this crossover has a lot of room left to grow, and hopefully it can fill those shoes as it continues. But what did you guys think about Crisis on Infinite Earth so far? Make sure you let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Have you found it underwhelming like myself, or have you absolutely been eating it up? Make sure you let me know your thoughts, and let's have a great discussion in the comment section down below. And as always, guys, if you want to see more DC content just like this, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss an upload from me, and I hope to see you guys again next time.